The New Testament scripture reading for this morning comes from Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Romans chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insulted you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another, then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. For I tell you that Christ has become a servant of the Jews on behalf of God's truths to confirm the promise made to the patriarchs so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles. I will sing hymns to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and sing praises to him, all you peoples. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will spring up, one who will arise to rule over the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray together. Lord God, we ask simply that you would teach us and that your word would accomplish all that you have set out for it to do, that it would not return empty and void. We ask, Father, that you would uh, um, soften the hard hearts and open blind eyes, and that in all these things you will be most magnified. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. What is the abundant life? What does it mean to live a life of abundance or to live abundantly? I mean, this morning, it sort of marks the point of no return, right, as we enter the holiday season this year. Uh, <laughs> I mean, for the next four weeks in our worship service, here we will be celebrating Advent as a way of preparing ourselves for both the second coming of Christ and looking back to Christ's first coming as, uh, into the world in human flesh. But even before we gather for worship together next uh, Sunday, this week we will celebrate Thanksgiving, uh, a day traditionally set aside, just as the name sounds, for giving thanks, uh, a day for counting your blessings, a day to consider all the things in life that we have to be grateful for. But then from that day on, you know, it's off to the races, right? Uh, Even beginning as early as Thanksgiving evening in some cases, the mad dash for Christmas begins. And for many, it will be a season marked with pursuing all those other things that we aren't blessed with now that we couldn't say thank you for on Thanksgiving Day, right? It It is a pursuit at this point for things that make our lives happier, things that make our life more abundant. It is a season where many are looking either to give or to receive that gift that will make life rich or more fulfilling or more abundant. Now, don't get me wrong. uh, I'm not condemning Black Friday or even the Christmas season. I'm not a Grinch. Uh, I simply want, as we come closer to that time of year when it is easy to be dissatisfied with what we have materially, to ask the question, how do we as Christians find peace and joy 
and a life of abundance in a world that tells us they cannot be found apart from this item that's on clearance at Kmart. You know, how do we as Christians live an abundant life? Well, our text opens up this morning, and the first thing we see in chapter 15 is serving one another. Serving one another. And I do promise the text answers the questions I just raised. However, we need to make sense of the context before we can answer that question. Well, as you move through the book of Romans, since we're kind of coming in here cold turkey, uh, no pun intended, if you're going to make sense of the main message that Paul is driving at again and again in Romans, you have to understand the context. You have to understand that there is a great tension in the first century church. What is it that Paul is concerned about as he writes to the church of Rome? What is he trying to address? What problem does he have in view as he writes to this people? Well, imagine, if you will, a time when the church has been the same way for a very long time, maybe even hundreds of years. Believers, as, uh, for as long as they can remember, they have worshipped God the same way as their parents, as their grandparents and their great-grandparents, with no significant change, really, to the life and worship of the church. I mean, things have been the way they have been for centuries, the problems of the church are always the same problems. The peoples of the church are the same families for generation after generation. And the people of God are very comfortable with the way things are. And suddenly, along comes a man who changes everything when he is crucified and raised from the dead. And it should change things a little bit for the church. And suddenly, nothing in the church is the same. You know, as this message goes forth, as people hear the good news of one who is raised from the dead, all these prophecies of scripture, all these things that have lain dormant and long forgotten are being realized and fulfilled. And suddenly all these things in scripture make sense that never did before because of a resurrection from the dead. What would it be like to witness such a change in the life of the church? Suddenly everything is different. There is a radical transformation in the life of the church at the time. It probably would be pretty awe-inspiring to watch unfold. You know, the faith of Abraham, it's being revitalized. It's being uh, uh, going forth and being changed. But when you put the boots on the ground, <laughs> it also means big changes for God's people. And one of the biggest changes that takes place in the first century church is the inclusion of Gentiles into God's people. You know, up until this point, by and large, the church would have been filled with one type of people from one nation, one specific group. And now, suddenly, the doors of the church are thrown wide open. And the Gentiles are now part of God's chosen people. The texts of Shem from Genesis 9 have been enlarged. All of these Old Testament promises that have been fulfilled, even as Paul begins listing them here for us in chapter 15. And it all sounds grand and wonderful because it is wonderful to see God's church grow, both spiritually and numerically, but it is causing serious friction between these two groups, the old Jews who had been there for ages and the Gentiles. And you can begin to understand a tension, an arising division that is happening between these groups. And Paul, throughout the book of Romans, he is dealing with problems that still often happen today in congregations. It's easy to become suspicious of another group of believers in the very congregation you worship in, especially when things change and shift, and it seems to be related to a new group of outsiders who have come in. And here we have in the New Testament a new body. Suddenly, two groups of people coming together into one flesh made up of Jews and Gentiles. And the cultural climate in this body, it is ripe for division and schism and divides. It would be like walking... <laughs> Pardon the, the, the illustration. It would be like walking into an NRA meeting and yelling, Hillary for president. I mean, the tension and distrust between the, the man who said that and the group meeting would be extremely high. There is a, a, a division and tension that is being built here within the body of Christ. And so one of Paul's main concerns as he writes to this body of believers in Rome 
is that the church not be divided against itself. He labors again and again to show how Christ Jesus was both for uh, the Jew and the Gentile. And that they are, have more in common together than what they have uh, to divide them apart. Because they have been bought for a price. They are united by the bonds and love of Christ Jesus. And so throughout the book of Romans, he demonstrates again and again how Jews and Gentiles are both sinners who cannot keep the law of God. And how faith in the God of the Bible, how faith in Christ Jesus, how uh, the faith of the Bible has always been about resting in a promised Messiah. You see how these two groups have the same common foundation that they are sinners in need of the mercy and merits of Christ Jesus. The foundation of the church is the same. It is faith in Christ Jesus to deliver us from our sins, to justify the ungodly, to make men right before him. And as you move through the book, Paul is dealing with this issue of unity in the church again and again because it is a church divided against itself. And he asks particular questions. How do we deal with the differences between those who are circumcised and uncircumcised? How do we deal with the differences between Jew and Gentiles, even as late as chapter 14, and their different practices of eating or not eating food offered to idols? How do we understand and continue to bring a spirit of unity between these very different groups? And as you come to chapter 15, Paul lays it out hard and heavy. He doesn't pull any punches at this time. He says, bear with the failings of the weak. Bear the burdens of one another. Build one another up. Seek to please and support your neighbor, not yourself. And scripture says to us, do what's in their best interest. Do what is, in th what is good for them, not for your own. Love them more than yourselves. Put their needs before your own needs and desires. Because you were both bought for a price. Because Christ Jesus, the one who brought these groups together because of him and you are united to him by faith because you are in him and this one came into the world in verse 3 he did not come to please himself but he laid down his life for you the reproaches that were meant for you fell upon him he bore your burden and it was no easy burden he carried your sin in the flesh of his very body. Therefore, verse 5, he says, live in harmony with one another. May you live in harmony with one another, not just with the ones you like, not just with the ones you've been friends with for years, but with those in that other group over there that you don't like very much and that you don't trust. Live in harmony with them so that in accordance with, with Jesus Christ, you may with one voice, all of you, Jew and Gentiles, glorify the Father. Notice he's taking these two groups, groups that are radically divided and bringing them together, saying you have one voice. And may you with one voice praise your God and Father for what he has done for you. May God grant you the endurance to do so, encouragement needed from the scriptures themselves, for they have been given to instruct you in these matters. Welcome one another as Christ welcomes you. Why? And as you move through the text, he tells us, because we were served. Because we were served. And again, this has been uh, made implicitly clear in the first few verses. But as you come to verses 8 through 12, Paul gives the reason why we are called to serve one another and to build one another up. He makes it very explicit here. It's not just because Christ is our example, as in verse 3, but we serve one another as members of Christ because Christ became a servant for us, to each of us, to every single one of you who rest in him, both circumcised and uncircumcised, both Jew and Gentile. Christ came to serve, not to be served. And in verses 8 through 12, he fleshes out what Christ's service specifically was to each group involved. To the circumcised, 
These ones who had God's law, these ones who had uh, been worshiping God throughout the ages, who were aware of the promises of God, Christ came and he demonstrated God's truthfulness. He confirmed the promises that were made long ago by God to the patriarchs of Israel. He fulfilled them. And just think about what that means for a Jew for a moment. Years and years and years of waiting on the promised Messiah to come. This promise that was held out long ago to Adam, the first man in this world that a Messiah would come and crush the head of the certain, this one promise to Abraham that the, that, uh, the Messiah would come through his loins and would bring Abraham into the inheritance of a good land, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, and Joshua, and David, and Isaiah, Generation after generation are waiting upon this hope, this promise that is held out for them. All the way through the whole history of the people of Israel, even through the very last book of the Old Testament of Malachi. God has been promising a Messiah, but it is a promise that hangs in the air, unfulfilled. And the question all along is, will God keep his promise to the people of God. Will he do what he said he would do? Is God truthful? Can we trust in this God? And Paul says in Christ Jesus, God keeps his promises. He fulfills what he promised to the patriarchs. He proved God's truthfulness that what he says he will do, and he does. And by so doing, Christ serves the Jews, bringing them hope, strengthening them in the promises of God. And in the truthfulness of this God, that what he says he will do. And then he moves on and he explains how, uh, uh, um, how he is, uh, 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 what he is doing for the Gentiles. God finally draws the Gentiles into his fold. No longer are Gentiles counted as outsiders, but they are counted now as the people of God. It's like the cool kids finally letting the geeks into the in crowd in high school, you know. Again... Just as God promised long ago, these ones who were once outside are not now brought near. And this promise over and over and over again appears in the Old Testament. And you see Paul quoting this promise at least four times in this particular text. He quotes Psalm 117 saying, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, all you nations. And it's interesting, here's this prophecy that Gentiles will be brought in, that they are meant to be worshipers with the Jews, and it's here in the book of the Psalms, a book specifically given to God's Old Testament people to use to praise him. Right smack dab in the middle of the Psalter is this reference to how all the nations, all Gentiles, will praise God and let all the nations praise him. This religion, this faith of Abraham and the Messiah is one that was always meant to go out to the nations, to all the world, and it happens through Christ's death and resurrection. It is being fulfilled here. Paul, again, he quotes Psalm 18 along the same lines, saying, among the Gentiles, I will praise you. Meaning, as I stand as a Jew among them, as I am in the midst of the Gentiles worshiping, I will praise you. We, Jew and Gentile together, we will praise God with one voice. And Paul quotes a third time from the scriptures, quoting from the song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, a song that is about God's chosen people, given to God's people as they are about to enter into the land of promise. You know, this promise that seems very specifically given uh, for just Jewish people as they are about to enter into the promised land that has been prepared for them. And as they have been called God to God's, God's people and in his place, and right at the very end of this song that is given specifically to the Jews, you see this, oh, by the way, <laughs> rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. I mean, here is God calling Gentiles to rejoice with the nation of Israel. Just as Israel is about to enter the land of promise, here at the very heart of Jewish religion, his entrance into the promised land is the promise from God that the Gentiles will be included in God's grace and mercy. And God calls Gentiles to rejoice with Israel, to rejoice alongside of Israel. And the point of all of this, as you see it unfolding, is God's plan 
God's plan was always to be merciful to the Gentiles. His plan of mercy and grace is finally being fulfilled. It is stretching out to all the peoples of the earth. They are being included in his mercy. And praise God for that. I mean, for most of us sitting here, I, I suspect that our ancestors weren't Jewish. Our ancestors were ones who worshipped uh, rocks and sticks. And yet God, by his grace, expanded out to the Gentiles. And through Christ Jesus, we are now gathered together and worship our God, the same God as our forefather Abraham. We've all been made part of this one people of God. Well, Paul quotes one final passage of scripture here that comes from the Old Testament reading today. He quotes Isaiah 11. And in the background of Isaiah 11, God is cutting down the tree of Israel. Israel is no longer a great nation in the book of Isaiah. It has become a stump. It is a barren place. It is cut down. Isaiah cannot keep, or uh, Israel cannot keep God's law perfectly because of their sinfulness, and they are considered a dead stump. But suddenly you come to Isaiah 11, and a shoot will come from this stump. And the shoot will bear fruit. The shoot is the Messiah, Jesus Christ himself. He will judge righteously. He will delight in the law of the Lord, unlike sinful Israel. He will do all things right. And he will make a new heavens and a new earth come about. And the text builds and builds until it crescendos in verses 10 through 12. With the Messiah gathering together his people. People from all those nations that have been enemies of God. Egypt and Assyria and Cush, he will gather together a people from Judah and Israel and from the four corners of the earth. God will draw a people to himself from everywhere, from every race, from every country, from every people. This grace and mercy of God will expand out. And Jesus Christ and the merits that he has, has and his blood and righteousness becomes the hope of all the Gentiles, the hope of all who believe. What is the point of all of this? I mean, what is Paul driving at? What does all this have to do with obtaining abundance and the abundant life? What does all this have to do with obtaining the abundant life? I mean, as you move from verses 1 to 12, or from verses 1 through 12, it doesn't seem to make much connection as you come to verse 13. And we've seen in these verses, we've seen how God calls the church to serve one another instead of self. And we're called to do so because Christ served us, both Jew and Gentile life, because he lived and died for both. And yet as you come to verse 13 in Romans 15, this culmination of Paul's Thought, he concludes praying that the God of hope would fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. But what's the connection between Paul's prayer for you and everything that has gone before in this chapter? What's the connection here that is being made? People of God, you see, Paul's prayer is that you would know joy and peace in believing in Christ Jesus. And that kind of peace that Paul is talking about is knowing your standing before God has changed, that there is a real change. It's not something that you just feel inside, but you, uh, it is actually realized like peace between two warring countries when they come to a truce. There is something real and tangible about a peace like this. And Paul's prayer is that you would know a real and tangible peace and then that peace would lead to joy. And as joy unfolds in you, that you would realize more and more what God has done, any burden that you carry, everything that you think you owe God because of your failings have been, has been paid for. And that the peace of God is given freely to you. And Paul says, if you have joy and peace in this way, because you know you're a sinner who doesn't deserve God's grace at all, 
because we have, do not serve one another nearly as well as we should. People of God, if you realized how much you've messed up in this life and have sinned against God, how even our best efforts aren't good enough, if you understand and know that Christ came and he died for your sins, that he took everything that was vile about you and the stench that was in the nostrils of God, and he washed it all away. It's all gone. You stand at peace with God. He will no longer make war with you. A God who no longer is seeking to do you harm because of the love of God found in Christ Jesus. Once you understand that, you then may, by the power of God and the Holy Spirit who is at work within you and causing you to understand this grace, you may abound in hope. Not wishful thinking, but a sure expectant, sure expectation of things to come. And people of God, if you can realize these things, if you can understand these things that are true of you, then you will truly begin to live the abundant life. Because the abundant life isn't about who dies with the most toys. It isn't about who has the greatest trophies or the best job. It isn't about a life free of pain. Paul makes it abundantly clear earlier in Romans that Jesus himself says that we will have tribulations and trials in this world, but the abundant life is about being at peace with God through faith in Christ Jesus, the only one who can make you right before God. And it is about the joy that flows from the reality that you are free in him and able indeed to draw near to him, and to walk in obedience out of love for all that he has done for you. And it builds an abundant hope in what is to come when we see Jesus face to face. That is the abundant life, dear Christian. And that is the abundant life that you live. Because if you believe these truths, you have the abundant life. It's been given to you. And if you live the abundant life, then you are free to serve one another. Even as Christ served the church, to lay down your differences with your brothers and sisters you have problems with, to lay down your suspicions for one another, your squabbles about who is doing what they're supposed to do, to care for your wife in the way you are meant to, to love your husband as you ought, who isn't even, you're able to do all these things because Christ serves you. Because if God made peace with you, surely you are called to be at peace with those whom Christ has purchased along with you, whether they be Jew or Gentile or old or young or male or female or bondservant or slave or, f or free. Our unity as the body of Christ flows from knowing the joy and peace of the gospel. One writer says this, and I'll close with this, about the church in Romans 15. He says, these people, this church, they may have different opinions. They may approach Christ in different ways. But the apostle declares that what they share in believing in Jesus is the joy and the peace of the kingdom. And in, joy, in that joy and peace, we can abound in the hope of the resurrection together as a body of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our Lord and our Savior, we come before you and we ask that you would continue to raise in us a spirit of love and of unity, build us together, bind us by the bonds of love for what is ours through Christ Jesus. We pray, Father, that you would uh, continue to turn our eyes to the salvation that is ours through Christ Jesus and his redemptive work upon a cross. We pray, Lord, that you would build us up and that you would strengthen us to serve one another, for this is not an easy calling. But we ask, Father, that you would remind us that we have an abundant life through Christ Jesus. What more can we have for if we have, if we have you? For surely you have declared, if you are for us, as you have declared in your word, that no one can be against us. Who can be against us? Father, we ask that you would be with us this day and that you would continue to draw us nearer unto you, even throughout, throughout this whole life, throughout this short earthly existence that fades away like a, a fog. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen.